I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. I'd been told up until this point in my life, Mark, that if you ever cough up blood, it's a matter of get to emergency immediately or you could bleed out and die. I remember realising that my mum and my sister weren't in the car. How do you tell your sister that you're having your final moments? Cystic fibrosis was something that inflicted itself on you when you were a young boy. How have you managed to turn out the way you've turned out? You have to accept the fact that life is unfair and sometimes those cards that you're dealt aren't going to be the ones that you wish they were. But I know for sure, throwing your cards into the middle and putting your hands up and walking away from that table gets you nothing. It's not what happens to you, it's how you respond to it. I was living proof that defying the odds is not impossible. What you believe about yourself is what you become. Bradley Driver, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Pleasure to be here, Mark. Driver as an Edinburgh. Yes. Very good well to, done. Good to see you again. Uh, last time I saw you was, I don't know, when was it? What, what was the date? Around, was it this year? Yeah, it was this year. It was, I think it was early March. It was a, It was an, I guess, an uncommonly hot day in March at Luna Park. At Luna Park, I remember it. And we were both there at... Uh, yeah, humankind. Humankind. Uh, he got this sort of ball of energy sort of sitting in the room there. I'm, I'm thinking, who's this dude? What's going on? And uh, somehow you um, managed to negotiate uh, meeting up again. Like it was just, it was like a pretty full on thing. You're a full on guy. Like yeah, yeah. Your energy, <laughs> energy. How old are you? 27. 27 now. And and I, I do recall that um, cystic fibrosis was something that um, you, know, you inflicted itself on you when you were a young man. Young boy, not young man, young young kid. I just want to get to the bottom of that. So I don't really understand what cystic fibrosis is. I've got a sense of it. It relates to your lungs, but I don't know any more than that. Yes, yeah, so cystic fibrosis is a degenerative but also um, genetic disease. So it's something that you are born with. So people always ask me, can I catch that off you? No, you can't. You're, you're well and truly safe. But it's something that um, around 30 3,600 to 4,000 Aussies live with. So every four days a baby is born with CF. And essentially it's a, it's a defective gene that stops the, the chloride channel from providing salt and water uh, to the organs in the body. And essentially what that does when it works effectively is it allows mucus, which moves, we think of mucus as something that sits in our respiratory system. You know, it's what you get when you're, you've are you got a bit of a cold or a flu and it sits on your lungs or it impedes your, your sort of nasal passage. But essentially mucus moves throughout the entire body and where that gene doesn't work effectively, the mucus gets thicker and stickier and tends to, to clog up and impair the function of those organs. So we see that typically in the lungs, you know, 99% of people who have cystic fibrosis have degenerative lung disease where they're coughing up a lot of mucus consistently. Their lungs become quite scarred. Their lung function and capacity is, is reduced, makes it really hard to breathe doing you know quite often simple tasks. So something as simple as walking up a set of stairs or just you know walking up the street to get a coffee can be quite difficult for someone with CF. But it also affects a number of different functions in the body as well. So a majority of people with CF, myself being you know included in this, have pancreatic insufficiency, which means usually when we eat something with protein or fat, the body will, when we eat carbs, for example, you know, you might have a piece of fruit that has had an apple on the way in, you know, your body would release enzyme through saliva to break down carbohydrates and that breakdown and and digestion process begins in the saliva with carbs. When it comes to protein and fat, it happens in the gut. Now, usually the pancreas would release digestive enzyme that it creates itself to do that, to take on the nutrients of that food and break it down. For someone with CF, you don't create digestive enzyme. So, you know, for a long time, I took 50 tablets a day, 30 of those from a very young age being digestive enzyme. And so we tend to see if you talk about symptoms, you know, they say that people with cystic fibrosis cough a lot. They tend to be quite underweight and, and don't develop and grow as a normal kid would because of the simple fact that they're not breaking down and, and taking on the nutrients from their food. So it can be quite a, I guess you'd call it a physically debilitating disease, not disease, not just because of what it does inside of the body, but in fact, the way that you look on the outside. It's very interesting. And your, yours is in the pancreas? Your... Yes, yeah, so the pancreas lungs. Yeah. I was also diagnosed with liver disease at the age of nine, which is um, something that happens to around 10% of people with CF. 
And so I got the full house, Mark. I got the full suite of challenges. But I'm very lucky that whilst I got cystic fibrosis, I was also born into the most incredible family. And if there was anyone to deal with the early challenges of a life with cystic fibrosis, it was my parents. I, like, I, but I look at you now. You just look like any other dude around your age. Uh, you look like you could run a marathon. Um, looks like you're, you're fairly muscled up. You're strong. You look you look good. Um, but my recollection, because when my kids were little, I remember I had to take them to hospital for lots of things. Always, when kids are little, I got four sons, always getting sick. And I remember seeing some kids with cystic fibrosis around their age walking around. Mm. In fact, it was at um, it was at Prince of Wales, I think, and uh, at Ramwick. And um, some of them had like uh, breathing apparatus on, and I always think, my God, like that is just looked dreadful. Mm. And as you said, um, you know, they don't get enough nu- nutrition, and they don't develop properly, et cetera, et cetera. How, how have you managed to turn out the way you've turned out? I, I believe it has a lot to do with perspective and belief. So I'll tell you a story, Mark. I love to tell a story. So when I was born, my parents were were quite shocked at the diagnosis because. So does it, do you come out? Do they diagnose? I mean, how's so that So you get work? diagnosed at the Guth, in the Guthrie's test um, in most cases, yeah. which happens, I think, at around three weeks. And so my parents were surprised at the news because I was, I was a pretty healthy newborn baby. You know, there were some things there that maybe indicated something wasn't quite right, but it wasn't so visible. And so when my parents received the news, you know, my mum recalls receiving that call and just being distraught because... They knew not that much about cystic fibrosis, but from what they could read up on and the people that they could talk to and and hear stories about this disease, it's quite horrible. And so a couple of months into my life, they went to my first ever CF specialist and this gent plainly sat them down the moment they walked into the room and said, your son would be better off with a terminal illness that would kill him or he'd get over because this will ruin his life. Fuck him. Yeah. and the shocker. And that is exactly what my old man and my mum said. My, my dad is, um, I'd say that my dad is one of those guys that he's pretty straight to the point. He doesn't hold back. And he said to that guy, you'll never see us or our son again. And they walked out of the room. And it's an incredible lesson for me. And, you know, with humankind, I was there delivering my story. And one of the first things I speak about in my story is that moment. Because that moment, well before I was able to to receive that information and see that as a lesson, I have hindsight to do that now taught me this incredible lesson that what you believe about yourself is most certainly a big influence in what you become or who you become. And my parents made a decision very early on that they wouldn't allow CF to limit or define my life. So they went to Sydney Children's Hospital, which is at Ramwick, you know, where you spoke about seeing some of those CF patients. They found a wonderful doctor by the name of John Morton. And, you know, from a very early age, I was blessed that I had a passion for physical activity and loved my sport. You know, I know you're a proud Roosters man. You know, my dream growing up was to be the next Brad Fittler. You know, and, and I come from a very sporty family where my old man, very similar to you, Mark, is, you know, right into his fitness and it's a big part of his life. My mum is super healthy and looks after herself. And so I was in an environment where that was encouraged. And it was something I was passionate about. So at these young ages, you know, I could walk into a doctor's surgery at the age of nine, be told that, oh, sorry, mate, but you've got liver disease. And whilst I was devastated that that took me off the football pitch, I wasn't devastated and and I wasn't buckled by, you know, a diagnosis like that because I was living proof and I was a living, breathing example that defying the odds is not impossible. You know, I was a state champion sprinter at 9, 10, 11. Like, as on track? On yeah, track, on track, 120 meters. And so I had all of these, I guess, all of this evidence to say that, well, yeah, I'm not supposed to be well, but look at me. I'm proving, I'm proving those doctors wrong. And at an early age, my parents shielded me somewhat from the negativity. And I'm so glad they did because they allowed me to, to cultivate my own mindset and they created an environment for me in which I was able to strive because I didn't believe anything should hold me back. Where do you get that, where do you get that belief from? Like, that's, a, that's a pretty unusual thing because like, I'd imagine the first response of, and a natural response of a lot of parents, oh, well, we've got to keep them cotton wool. Um, we're not going to allow them to go out there and the, catch a flu because it might have a, a more detrimental effect on Bradley than it would have on a, a, another kid who doesn't have, you know, your precondition. Um, let's not put him on the footy field because, I don't know, he might get hit in the chest or whatever. Um, where, where, where did your parents, A, get the strength from to, oh, man, it was, yeah, well, strength is one thing, but sort of maybe the intellect or the um, bandwidth or the perspective 
that they should encourage you. Because obviously when you're a little kid, really little, um, I'm talking about a like sub five or four or whatever, um, parents, it's not the kid's decision. Parents have to open the gate to let the kid out. Once the kid's out, the kid will run around and have a good time. But someone has to open the gate. They'd done as much research as they could. You know, it was I was born in 96, and whilst that doesn't make me very old, what it does mean is that I was born in an era where there wasn't free access to information like there is today. Yeah, not, not much on the internet. No, for sure. You know, you couldn't go on and listen to, you know, a guy like me on a podcast yeah. talking about how fruitful my life has been with cystic fibrosis and go, oh, well, there's a great example of what Brad's life can be like. But they'd done as much research as they could. There was a, a distant relative who... Um, had CF, but in a, in a really bad way and unfortunately passed around the age of 30. And so they, I guess they didn't have extremely positive signs around them. But what they believed and, and what they did, I guess, was they separated themselves from almost the CF community and just decided to cultivate their own mindset and belief towards it. They decided to be outliers. And so at a time where the conversation was very negative, they chose to be positive. Now that takes incredible strength. I was having a conversation about leadership yesterday with two of my best mates. And I was saying that when I think about great leaders, I think of my parents. Because I remember clearly and vividly a memory at the age of nine, receiving the news that I had liver disease, asking the doctor what that meant for my life and what would change. And I remember he said, well, Brad, you're going to have to take another four tablets a day. And I said, well, I'm taking 20 odd as it is. What's another four? And he goes, well, that's a great attitude, it's only mate. 20% more, it's nothing. Exactly. And I was like, I was devastated that I had to quit footy because my liver and spleen were now hanging deep below my rib cage and, you know, they were exposed. But I remember looking at my parents the minute that he said, you have liver disease. And I looked straight at their body language and their face. And I seen two stoic human beings who looked back at me and smiled. And they'd done an incredible job whilst I know from being able to speak to them now, and I'm still very close with my parents there, you know, I idolize my parents. I know that at the time they were like ducks. They looked calm on the surface, but their legs were kicking underwater. You know, it's, I guess it's very challenging to hear about your son having, you know, medical challenge after medical challenging. And it almost feels like all of that adversity is piling up as something that we had to face at some point and we're facing on a daily basis but they just did an incredible job of remaining strong in front of me. And I don't know where they got that from, Mark, but let me tell you, it's it's because of them that I'm here. You know, I have the most challenging prognosis for someone with CF. My diagnosis with liver disease, um, with a pancreatic insufficiency, with the now, lungs. Now, Yeah, with, with the challenges that I've had over the course of my lifetime, it is them who have, who have kept me in the fight. And now I'm in a position where... Um, I get to I get to take the reins and do that myself, and I have been for a couple of years now. As it you know, as a man, but I just look at them and I idolise them because where they got that strength from, I'm not sure. But let me tell you, like I needed people like that in my corner. So a word you mentioned, which is sort of an ancient word, um, and one that gets thrown around a lot, but not many people know what it means or have experienced it. You said stoic. Um, so often we get told. We need to endure what's going on, and if we do manage to endure it, people reflect on our endurance as stoicism. And then you said to me, my parents looked at me when I got diagnosed with liver disease in the, I guess it was a doctor was telling me that, that I looked at my parents and my parents looked at me and gave me that sense of stoicism but perhaps you assumed at least, but perhaps under uh, under the water they were paddling pretty fast and sort of thinking, shit, what are we going to do from here? Is Do you think that's stoicism? So I think that whilst they look very composed, their body language was composed and confident. I believe that, you know, there's almost a statement for me that can define stoicism, and I know people have different ideas around this. Oh, I'd like to know what your idea of it is. Yeah. You've experienced this stuff. Not many of us have. My idea of it is... It's not what happens to you, it's how you respond to it. And I think that when very early on at three weeks, I were told I had cystic fibrosis. And I can say this from my own personal perspective as well, growing up and knowing that I had cystic fibrosis and knowing that life was going to be different for me, that life was going to be full of challenges and adversity. It's like playing a game of poker, Mark. You sit down at that table and you have to accept the fact that life is unfair. And sometimes those hand, that hand that you're dealt, those cards that you're dealt, aren't going to be the ones that you wish they were. But I know for sure that throwing your cards into the middle 
and putting your hands up and walking away from that table gets you nothing. It gets you nothing because unfortunately, not like a game of poker, you can't just come back later. Like this life is a one-time thing. And once you're in it, you're in it and you have to make the best of what you've got. You know, my parents decided and that bled into then my mentality that this is the hand that we have been dealt. Cystic fibrosis will be a part of my life for the rest of my life until maybe, God willing, one day there is a cure. But right now there's not. And, you know, and we heard about people who are waiting around and hoping for a cure. We never waited and hoped for anything. We attacked it for what it was. And so in the way that we responded to everything, we responded vigorously and with a lot of spirit. And so, Mark, I, I can honestly and confidently say today that cystic fibrosis has been one of the greatest blessings in my life because it's made me the man that I am. I believe that we're a product of what we face and, and learn to overcome or at least deal with. And so I, I look at myself now and I look at the people around me. I believe that the strength of my connections are a product of the challenges that we've faced. And I have this, these two incredible parents that I've spoken about a lot so far. And you know, on my left arm here, I've got a lot of tattoos. So the one on the outside of my upper arm is the statue of Hercules, right, which is positioned in Rome. I remember seeing that statue in Rome and looking up at it and the way that the statue looks down at you. I remember looking up at it and thinking, what a figure, what a striking figure. It's a role model to look up to. It's a symbol of strength. I thought about my dad immediately. I remember seeing a statue of an angel, thinking about my mom, how much of a guardian angel she's been for me and how much she's protected me and looked after me. You know, my dad is someone I look up to. I want to be like that man, someone who wants to have kids in the future, who may very well have challenges and adversity of their own. I want to be that stoic character. You know, then I have the, you know, the statue of Nike, which is a symbol of strength for, for the people of Greece. And I think about what that means. And I think about my sister. My sister is two and a half years younger than I am. I remember being six years of age and sitting up at the table every morning for breakfast with my little sis next to me. And I took tablets from the moment I could swallow for my food. And so I'd sit there and I'd take my tablets and my sister would cry that she couldn't take tablets like a brother. And so, you know, I was never going to walk into an environment and be ashamed of who I am because, you know, the little sis that I love the most wants to be exactly as I am. She looked up to me. So it was such a symbol of strength for me that I had that sort of support and a sister. And so I have all of these, these collections of ideas and images that are very stoic by their nature, but they represent this in my life. So I wouldn't change any of it. I, I honestly believe that you know, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. We wouldn't have met a humankind if I didn't have this story to tell. And so I believe the mindset is you can't change what you're challenged by in life. You can't you know, wind back the clock and, and remove things from your past. It is what it is, you know, but make a decision to move forward. Make a decision to face it. You talked about the um, Statue of Hercules, a lot of symbolism there, and um, all of those statues or, or myths, Greek myths, Roman myths, whatever they might be, were really um, nearly, they were religious, but the more, more probably more importantly, they were spiritual. And the fact that you've got them on your arm um, and then you can, and you actually gain strength from them sort of talks to a sort of level of spirit, spirituality that um, it looks like to me you have, and I'm not getting down the religious route, I'm just talking about spirituality as such, um, believing something bigger, something stronger, something inspirational. Um, do you think that having CF actually opened the door for you to be spiritual in that way? Yeah, I think who are we without faith or hope? You know, hope is in my opinion, the best medicine. You know, that's what people want. They want hope. They want hope that for everything they're challenged by now, that maybe tomorrow, if I get up and face today, could be a little better. You know, and there have been plenty of nights where I've gone to bed and it's been worse than the day before. What does that mean? Pain or uncomfortable um, discomfort? Bleeding lungs, those sort of things where, you know, you were great the day before and all of a sudden you're coughing up blood as you lie down and go to bed. And that can be scary. And there have been some some terrifying times in which, you know, maybe I've had what you call a life realization or a brush with my own mortality where it makes you think very differently about this idea of, of life and death and what a gift this is. And so when we, we speak about spirituality, something I've done every night from the age of 13 is pray before I sleep. 
and I wouldn't say I'm a super religious man. I went to a Christian school and I have a lot of friends who are religious and, and quite connected to their, their faith. Um, but I wouldn't say I'm a religious man. I'd say that I'm, I'm a man who believes somewhat in putting intention out there. So every night I pray that, you know, from the age of 13, I, I actually started when my parents separated. They're still very good friends to this day. But when they separated for the first time in my life after having such a close family unit, I remember going to sleep. My dad used to be a police officer. I was going to sleep at, at mum's house this night. And we used to spend a lot of time with both my parents. And I would call the, the parents whose house I was at. I'd call the other parent every night before I went to bed, every morning. And I still do to this day. I live you know, with my partner and I speak to my dad on FaceTime three times. My mum on FaceTime three times. We're so close. For the first time, I was faced with the, the reality that man, I don't get to see my old man tonight when I put my head down on the pillow. How do I know he's safe? He works in a dangerous job. It's very unpredictable. And I remember thinking, all I can do in a situation I can't control is choose to have some faith. And so I remember just praying for the first time. First time I was ever, I ever prayed willingly and wasn't forced to at school, of course. And I remember just feeling a little bit better about it. I thought, well, I'd done something. I'd done something about that, I guess that unknown, that fear. And ever since then, it's felt weird for me to try to go to sleep without praying. So I'm not kidding you, Mark. Every night for the last 14 years, I've prayed before bed. And I, you know, I've got mates who are very spiritual. One of my best mates is very spiritual. Talks about the universe and talks about putting, you know, intention out to the universe and manifestation. And I believe that manifestation is nothing without action. And so I am a very action-oriented human being. But I believe that, you know, we talk about that first lesson my parents taught me. What you believe about yourself is what you become. And so you have to have some faith in that process because we're often projecting. We're often looking at where we want to be or who we want to be or what we want to overcome. And to do that, you've got to have some hope. So I'd say that, yeah, I am in many ways quite a, a spiritual cat. To some extent, it's tattooed on you. It's actually nearly ritualized on your, on your left arm. You know, and what's interesting though, each one of these, the, the, the images represents your, your mum, your dad and your sister. Mm. It's nearly like you carry your family around on you, on your left, on your left side as a kid. And, you know, like, I mean, sub teenager period, what, what are some of the worst things that you might have experienced? I don't mean emotionally, I, I mean, physically. So like you mentioned, you might be coughing up blood. I mean, what, what are the sort of symptoms that a kid with cystic fibrosis might be feeling? The truth is, Mark, that whilst I had all these scary diagnoses on paper, it wasn't until I hit, wasn't until I really hit 18 years of age that I was challenged by my CF. So every day I would take 50 tablets a day as a, as a young man in my early teen years. I'd do sit down for an hour, hour and a half every night and do nebulizers. So I was breathing in solutions to thin the mucus on my lungs to break it up. That's one of those steam, you know? steam masks. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And I do like a pet mask, which was breathing against resistance to move it. I train every day. I remember, you know, being 16, my dad and I. Physically? Yeah, physically. Yeah, as an exercise, you mean? Exercise yep. every day, whether it was sprint training or, you know, playing touch after I finished footy or, you know, when I was like sort of 15, 16, me and my old man would wake up at five every morning, get in the gym at 5.30, lift weights together, race each other for 2Ks on a treadmill. You know, we're always very competitive like that. But it wasn't until I was 18 that I really started to face some health challenges. Now, I believe that, you know, for a couple of reasons, cystic fibrosis by its nature is progressive and degenerative. And so usually the older you get, the more challenges you experience, right? But I believe that sometimes when you're getting a lot of wins, what do you do? You get a little bit complacent. And I remember at 16 being told by my doctor, he said, mate, I have very good reason to believe based off your numbers and what we're seeing in your body's response to cystic fibrosis, that you would be amongst the top 5% of healthiest humans in the world with CF. Now, that's a nice little pat on the back. You go, I'm doing something right. But I almost took it as, mate, put the feet up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you cured. <laughs> yeah, you cured. You don't have to worry about this. And so, you know, that is most certainly not a message for anyone with CF. You can never put the feet up with or this condition. for anybody, condition. by the way, even without CF. And it's a great point, Mark. I think, you know, there's this old lady, just a sidebar here, this old lady, Barb. She's a, she's a gorgeous lady. I see her every morning when I'm running along the track with my partner, Soph. And we'll run along the track and, and I don't know how old Barb would be, but she's an elderly woman, Mark. And I know she used to be a marathon runner in the day because I've spoken to her a few times and stopped, but, but her and 
I don't know if it's a partner, a hubby or a friend, they're always running. And I said to Barb one day, I said, you never stop, do you? And she goes, Brad, you stop, you die. So I believe in that, Mark. But, you know, I, I think that I got a little bit complacent and I stopped doing all the extra stuff that had kept me really well. It was around 18 or 19. Around 18, you know, and, and most people at 18, they, they start to go out and party a little bit too much. Maybe the vices of alcohol or drugs come into their life. For me, that was never the case. I was so grateful for the health that I had. I knew I'd never drink because I had liver disease, um, which uh, doesn't bother me too much. Sometimes I wish I could sit down and have a beer with my old man. Like, But, you know, me and my dad have many other great things that are a part of our life. So drinking and not being able to drink doesn't bother me. You don't me. miss so much, mate. Don't no. Worry about it. You know, I've saved a lot of money and, you know, saved a lot of hangovers, I'm sure. But... I definitely just got a little, a little bit complacent and I went into the professional arena and tried to start really pushing myself from a business perspective. But then I, you know, I remember being 18 and I was going in for what had become over the course of the two years prior, a routine esophageal varicity surgery. So because of the, the pressure in my liver and spleen, not all the blood that should pass through those organs does. It starts to take alternate routes out of the organs and sort of makes its way up into the, the base of the esophagus where you've got these varices or these like veins that line the esophagus. And they're supposed to have blood moving through them, of course, but not at that volume. And so these varices tend to fill up and get big and almost, you know, come out very thick and juicy. And it's dangerous because, you know, that's a part of the, the track in which we eat food, swallow food. And if, you know, let's say, for example, big does night it narrow on the, the passage, does it? It narrows the passage. And, you know, let's say you've had a big night on the Doritos. They're quite a sharp chip. Yep. They go down and, and as comical as it sounds, you know, could potentially slice one of those varices or just due to the increased pressure, one of those varices bursts then you're internally bleeding. And so from the age of 16, we were made aware that this was likely happening within my body. And so I'd go in for a surgery every 12 to 18 months where they'd go in with a camera, they'd observe these, and if they were big enough, they almost suck them into a little vacuum and they go up like a balloon. They put a little elastic band literally around it. It restricts the blood flow and they die off in about 24 sort of hours. Them. Yeah, exactly. And so I'd been planned to go in for one of these routine surgeries and I was overdue. And, you know, the week leading up, I started to get quite unwell and that looked like a lot of temperatures and then like I'd be ice cold and ice hot for the course of a whole week. And then I got to the end of the week, it was the day of surgery and I developed a, a really nasty cough. I remember getting to the hospital and I went for my pre-surgery check with a nurse and she said, mate, your blood pressure is 180 over 100 Whoa. and your temperature's through the roof. Like you're incredibly unwell. We can't operate on you today. Like that could be really dangerous. And so they said, we'd love to put you into a hospital bed, but as most hospitals do, they had, you know, no vacancy. And so they said, we'll send you home. We'll call you tomorrow when we can get a bed. And I'd been told up until this point in my life, Mark, that if you ever cough up blood, it's likely one of those varices has burst and it's a matter of get to emergency immediately or you could bleed out and die. So it's a scary thing. Now, I remember sitting on the lounge the next day with my old man and we're waiting for this call and I'd been coughing just nonstop for hours. And this one particular cough, I tasted a familiar, but not too familiar taste in my mouth, that metallic taste that you get when you bite the side of your cheek or your tongue and it was blood, except I could taste a whole lot of it. And I ran into the laundry and I spat in the laundry tub and just the bottom of the tub just was stained red. And I started coughing consistently and spitting blood out. You could tell it was fresh blood, there were no clots in it. I remember yelling out to my dad at the top of my lungs and in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I was supposed to be operated on yesterday. These varices were overdue. One of them's burst. Called out to dad at the top of my lungs and he raced into the laundry and seen the blood. And within the matter of two minutes, we're in the car. I remember racing towards Wollongong Hospital and just sitting in the car. And it was like a life realization. I remember, you know, there's a Confucius quote that I love that every man lives two lives. The second begins when they realize they have just one. I remember having like that realization in that moment that like this could be it. Like, this is a matter of how quick we get there. If this is what, if like, what I think is happening is happening to me right now, like, I might not survive this. And so I looked at my dad and I immediately felt guilty because I thought, what happens if he doesn't get me there in time and he has to wear the weight of responsibility for the rest of his life that he didn't get me to the hospital quick enough? And his like, son predeceasing him. Of course, which, you know, is every parent's worst fear. I remember realizing that my mum and my sister weren't in the car and thankfully they worked at the same place at the time and I called and my sister was on reception. She answered 
and it like it was such a challenging challenging conversation because how do you tell your sister that you know maybe you're like you're having your final moments to meet you at hospital you know and i just said i'm coughing up a lot of blood i don't know what's going to happen but you and mum need to meet us at emergency immediately and i'm so thankful mark that when we arrived 10 or 15 minutes later i'd somehow stabilized what we found after a bunch of testing was that it wasn't my esophageal varices that were bleeding, but it was my lungs. And so I developed a heavy case of pneumonia, which for someone with CF can be deadly. Which is sort of better though. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's sort of better it's, than- It's lucky, mate. It's yeah. so lucky. And I count my lucky stars every day. And you know, when I think about that moment, the next weeks were challenging. When I was in hospital, I had a spew bag to cough up mucus every day for the next week. There was so much of it. I lost nine kilos in the space of three weeks. And I'd never been so sick in my life. And I remember sitting up in hospital one morning and thought, and thinking, you know, there's that um that Mike Tyson quote that everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Holy fuck, did I get an uppercut that day, Mark? I just thought this CF thing is has been a part of my life, but it hasn't challenged me like it has right now. Like it's game on. I need to do something about this. And that was for me the first moment in which you know, it's almost like the bell rang. It's like, this is real now. This is a fight. You started thinking about your business life because, you know, like you can't go through, and obviously you didn't, you can't go through your life, well, you can, but it's a punish if you've got to go through your life always trying to try look after your illness mm -hmm. and uh, think about that every day, every, every minute of the day and also feeling guilty about how your parents and everybody else is trying to look after you. At what point... Did Bradley start to think to himself, I've got to do some business. I've got to do some work now. I've got to start to set myself up. Do From the know? moment I come into this world, Mark, I am a, whilst CF I knew would be challenging and full of adversity, I was always the first to tell you that I'd, I wouldn't kick the bucket before 100. You know, I always believed that I'd have a very long and fruitful life. It's, it's hard to explain, but from a very young age, I was, I was always out in the world trying to do something. You know, I was the kid that was sitting down writing business plans or writing picture books or, you know, narratives, you know, in between all my sport, one of the things I love to do was write stories. And I love to try and sell those stories to my family or come up with an idea or a plan. And I was always very active in that sense from a young age. And so there was always something like that in me. And both my parents are really hard workers. So I witnessed them work really hard as a young guy. And so that definitely instills a level of work ethic in you where you want to go out and be successful. But I believed I had every reason to be because life was more precious to someone like me. So I wasn't going to sit around on the couch, you know, and just and count my blessings and not do anything about the fact that, you know, the clock is ticking. But you could, you could always sit back and say, ah, oh, stuff it. And the clock's ticking. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, not going to put myself out there. I'm going to just, I don't know, whatever. You could have, I mean, what, like, is what, there's not much in it though, but like, why did you decide to do something with, with your life? You know what? I can, be, I can be empathetic to understand that some people would, would think or feel that way, but I can't be sympathetic to accept that that's their choice. Yeah, for, for yourself because that's your, not your personality. For sure. It's just not me, Mark. And I just always believe that, like, you get one shot at this, you know, and that's so cliche. But there's a reason why we have cliches because usually there's a lot of truth in them. And oh, they represent, they represent a lot of the population. 100%. And, and I just refuse to believe that my life would be anything less than extraordinary. In fact, I believe that because of these challenges, there were more extraordinary things ahead of me. And so from a young age, I started to look at those opportunities. I had a real interest in physical activity. So my first beginnings in, I guess, would say my professional life were actually as a PT. And my, my dad and I ran a little small business together where we used to do body composition scanning for a while. But really, my, I'd say my professional career began at around 20 when uh, I stepped into real estate. As an agent? As an agent. So I remember my, my nan, God rest her soul, my, my nanny Rhonda, she's passed a couple of years ago now, but she always said to me, my mum's in, in the sales business. My mum's an incredible car saleswoman. She's actually Mazda's um, biggest, done it, Mazda's biggest number of sales for a couple of years running. She's now in Volkswagen. And um, my mum's a killer when it comes to business. And I remember, you know, I'm quite similar to my mum in my, my personality. My dad's a rural character too, but my dad's always been in, in more physical labor and more physical jobs. And he was a police officer for many years. But my nan always said to me, mate, you could sell ice to Eskimos and you love to talk. You should go into real estate. 
And I thought, it's probably not a bad point. And I, I liked property. I liked homes. I, I at one point through my school, um, through my schooling time, thought about architecture as a potential career. So I thought, maybe there's something in this for me. And I kind of stumbled my way into a, a position that wasn't available as a trainee and and found very quickly that I one of the things I love, Mark, is I love to learn. I love to learn in a practical manner. And so I found just, I fell in love with the business in the first 12 months where, you know, I remember being, I don't know if I should be saying this, but I remember being six months in and just craving the opportunity to go out and sell my own stuff. You know, at that point I was working under two established agents in my area who were great blokes and, and really hands-on with teaching me the business. And I just wanted to prove to them that I, I knew how to do it by myself. I was 20 at the time. And of course, every 20 year old man thinks they know it all. And I remember one of my bosses had gone away to Bali and he's gone just for four days. One of his properties had passed in at auction and he said, mate, if you don't mind, can you run the open house for me on the weekend, make some calls, try to get some people there. Let's just see if we can maintain some interest. And the minute he walked out of that office, I set myself a goal to sell it that weekend. And, you know, I, I caught a bunch of people, got a few people to the, the open and just managed to get a really good offer after working with this, um, this family back and forth. And, and I didn't want to call him. He gave me permission. I said, do you give me permission to sell it if I get this number? And I think it was like 1.15 million or something. And um, he said, mate, if you get that number, you've got every right to sell it. And I thought, I have to get these contracts signed and exchanged before he gets back to the office on Monday because I don't want him to have any hand in this. I want him to know that it was me from start to finish. So I remember on a, a Saturday night racing out to get the contract signed by the purchasers. On the Sunday morning, I was at the vendor's house. We got the contract signed. And, and I just remember a remark from them where they said, is that all we've got to sign? Is that all we've got to do? And I said, yeah, sweet, no worries. And I rocked up to the office the next day, put the contracts down in front of my boss, and I said, how's that? And he goes, mate, that's brilliant, but who's buying it? There's no details of the purchases. <laughs> and I remember just going, oh, I knew there was something else. You know, I was so eager, Mark. I just I just wanted to prove myself. And and I fell in love with that from a very early from very early on in it. But the thing that I, I failed myself with is at a time being 20, as we all do, I had mad out a bunch of insecurities and, you know, I, I had this idea and this thought in my head that if I made a lot of money and if I had a lot of flashy things, it would make me feel better about the things that I, I hadn't truly accepted yet. And so I started to, whilst I fell in love with the business, I started to set my sights too much on the, the idea of financial success and what that would give me. And in the process, what I found is, you know, after moving to Melbourne 13 months into that career, back to Wollongong a year later, I'd, I'd fallen out of love with it and fallen out of love with myself and found myself, I, w I was definitely not depressed, Mark. I had, I was definitely at a mental rock bottom though. I had some real challenges that I had to face. I was the unhealthiest I'd ever been. Um, what does that mean though, in terms of unhealthy? You mean unfit as in, as in unfit or? Unhealthy mentally in, I just lo lost all sense of self-worth, direction, purpose, passion for life. Routine. R routine. I was... But I didn't look forward to getting up in the morning. Um, it was a challenging time. I had great people around me and I was ever thankful for the many blessings that I had, but I, I didn't feel excited about f my future. I felt very unsure, but I'd also physically hit rock bottom. Is that the first time you ever really experienced that? Oh, most certainly, which is, you know, it's, it's interesting to say because I'd been faced with challenges my whole life. That's what I mean. But I think I knew it was my own doing. And I think that's what hurt me. I think I'd led myself astray. But in, in what regard? Like, uh... I just focused on the wrong things, Mark. I lost sight of what was really important and I found myself snappy. I'd lost my health. You know, I remember, you know, being 23 and my life changed at 23, meeting um, another man. I'll tell you that story. But I'd been in, I'd been in hospital. I'd been told that I need to go in hospital. I'd developed a really dangerous infection in my lungs. And it's just because I hadn't been exercising, Mark. I'd been focused so much on financial success and trying to make my career work. Just exercise had gone out the door. It wasn't something I did anymore. And you know, I do average a bit of training here and there, but it was effortless in, in the sense that it should have been full of effort and it should have been you know, with purpose to keep myself well. But I was definitely not fit. I'd put on about 10 kilos. Um, I was actually about 12 kilos heavier than I am now. Well, that's a lot of weight. Yeah, a lot of weight. Um, you know, a couple of lattes and Vicky's at the desk every day, mate, when you're in a sedentary job, job will do that to you. And, you know, I remember being told I had this potentially deadly infection called Burkholderia capacia, which 
once you develop it, it can be very resistant and hard to move for people with CF. I remember getting told by the doctor, you need to go in a hospital immediately because we need to hit this with heavy IVs 24 seven for the next two weeks. And I remember being devastated, Mark, like physically, I looked so pale and so unwell. My face had broken out in cystic acne, like my immune system was so compromised. And just, I felt shit about myself. I went into hospital. It was the first day in hospital. Never once have I entered a hospital and not had my parents beside me. They've always been so supportive and they were there on that first day. And I remember my mum and I were walking down the hallway to get a cup of tea. I just settled in. And thankfully, being someone with cystic fibrosis, you're at risk of cross infection. So they always put you in a, in a private room within the public hospital. So you have your own space, which is a luxury when you're in the public system. And so we're walking down the hall and my mum bumped into an older gentleman and my mom gave him a hug and said hello and he introduced himself and his name was Ernie. And my mum had sold Ernie a car. Of course she had. She'd sold everyone a car in Wollongong at that point. And we started chatting and Ernie had cancer. He had terminal cancer and his room was just next to mine. And I remember he pointed into his room and I looked in there and I seen three other gentlemen who were really sick as well. And the energy of that room felt really low. And I remember looking at this guy and thinking, far out, this guy needs a mate. He would have been in his mid-60s, so he's you know, way too young to be facing you know, terminal illness, in my opinion. You know, he had so much life left to live and he was such a, a, a life, you know, he was such an alive character. You know, he had so much energy and life about him. And I just thought, God, this guy needs a mate. And so I said, Ernie, if at any stage in the next two weeks while I'm here, you need to escape your room and, and come for a chat. You know, I'm always here, knock on my door. I'm not going anywhere. And it was that afternoon at two o'clock, tea and biscuit cart come around hit my room, I got my fair share, hit his room and then he knocked on the door and he was holding his cup of tea and he come into the room and nearly every day for two weeks, Ernie and I sat down, had a conversation, bit of afternoon tea together. I remember speaking to this guy who was at the end of his life and he never spoke about the financial success or the possessions. He just kept talking about his grandkids, his children, like the moments that made his life exciting. He had a very exciting job in which he'd really enjoyed and was passionate about. And he had so many great moments and memories he'd experienced in his life. And I remember every time he left the room, I'd sit there in my bed and think, man, I'm, I'm pursuing the wrong things. Those things are important to have. But they shouldn't be my sole focus. Like I've lost the sense of who I am. So I made a pact to myself in that hospital that I'd change, that, I, that I'd go out and, and figure out who I am what makes me tick, what I was passionate about again. About, like a value judgment. What are your values? What, what, uh, 100%. What, and what do you value? 100%. And, and I think that everyone needs a sense of purpose or meaning in life. And I was like, you know, I don't think you find that. I think you create that. So I'm going to go create that for myself. And, you know, only passed a couple months later, but he had a life-changing impact on me. And that was his legacy. That was to his some legacy. extent, in, in relation to you at least. Yeah. So what did you change? What did you do? As a result of meeting Ernie and coming out of hospital, obviously you got better, but what, what did you change? What did you pursue after that? Well, I'd say that this isn't sound advice for anyone listening because in hindsight, it, it was quite chaotic. But I, I started to change my environment at work. So I left the office and started working. You know, my bosses, you know, being the great human beings they were, gave me full reign. They said, whatever you think you need to do to get the mojo back, try it. And so I'd work out of a cafe in the mornings, go to my appointments in the afternoon. I started testing a bunch of different things. I started looking after my health again and trying to be somewhat active. And then I got to a point where I realized that I just don't enjoy this environment and this work anymore. I need to completely change and flip thing on like this thing on its head and just go and figure things out. Now, funnily enough at the time, I just bought my first property. So I just bought an apartment, had a mortgage for the first time. And after reading the last page of The Alchemist, and this sounds so chaotic, what an incredible book that is. You know, the book's As message, in Paolo, Paolo Coelho's yeah, books, yeah. You know, and, and a big part of the message of that book is, you know, a person's only real obligation is to go in search of their personal legend or their purpose, their meaning for life. And so I read the last page of that and then went, went and handed in my resignation. And I walked into a world in which COVID hit and things changed. But I just, I'd started this podcast thing. I started getting a little bit of passion back for life. You know, I remembered that Your as a young podcast. man. Yeah, my own podcast. And I remembered as a young man, I love storytelling. I love conversation. And I was starting to leave for the first time my little bit of work in the podcast every day 
with more than I than I went into that conversation with. I felt topped up. I felt like I was getting like life back. I thought this feels great. I'm feeling a sense of meaning in this. And so I started to to discover how important that was for me to be connected to storytelling and conversation. I realized what it had done for me as it had done you know, throughout my whole childhood. And whilst the next couple of years that I followed were, were challenging from a financial position because I threw in my job with a mortgage, ended up going broke, selling my place, you know, and I've, I've bounced around trying to figure it out for a couple of years, but I've, I've found my direction in life now. And there's something exciting about that. And what's your podcast called? It's been through many name iterations, as I'm sure many podcasts have, but it's now quite a lot to talk about. What do you talk about? I mean, what, what, what's the, the theme or the thematic <laughs> of the podcast? And I'm a big believer, Mark, that I, I see my purpose and the meaning I get from life now in uplifting and inspiring hope through storytelling, whether that be through my story, through the story of others. And I believe that, you know, when you're, you're facing real adversity or at a really challenging point in your life, you know, you're looking to people who can be an example for you. You know, so a young entrepreneur will look to you. They'll look to the work you've done. That they'll seek you out through your podcast. They'll look for stories and opportunities to connect with a way outside of their hardship. You know, a way through the challenges that they're facing right now. They'll seek inspiration and, and they'll get hope from that. I spoke about how important hope is, and I recognise that as a young man who had a chronic illness, who was told that he wouldn't survive his teenage years, I had a story that could help. You know, hopefully thousands of people in Australia with chronic illness. But I, always, I, I also, through that story, had an opportunity to connect with guests who had their own very individual stories that could do the same thing for people who are walking paths similar to them. That relates to their hardship, for example. Like, did you talk to Harry during Harry Garside? I'm talking about during his drama with uh, no, I his didn't. Ex. So I, I spoke to Harry immediately after the Olympics. You know, and, and Harry and I have somewhat stayed in contact. You know, he's a, he's a busy cat. Harry, he's a great man. I've got a lot of time and, and respect for him. But I, I love, you know, when you look at characters like Harry, you know, his composure, he, his composure. And I'm sure there were moments where through that hardship, he was stressed. But you look at the way that, you know, he didn't change himself. He remained Harry. And I respect that so much, you know, to talk to a guy like Will Ahmed. I'm, I'm a fan of Whoop, you know, fan of his business. And, you know, I was lucky enough to connect with Will and have a conversation. And I remember the moment that Will walked into the room He's got 500 employees in his you know, office in Boston. He walked into the room and from the moment he locked eyes with me, Mark, his, his attention was never lost. He locked in, he was on me, he was present in that conversation. And I thought, for someone who feels a little bit stressed and erratic trying to do a bunch of different things in my life right now, God, I can learn something from this man. You know, he's locked in, he's laser focused. He has an ability to, you know, focus his energy on the task at hand. So all of these guests have these incredible, incredible opportunities to teach. And so for me, I have the privilege of, you know, like the audience, learning from those people. I have the privilege of connecting with these people and hearing parts of their story that connect with mine. You know, and, and I'm sure many people can relate to this. I think we all can as human beings. You know, story is a big part of the human experience. It's how we learn, it's how we grow, it's how we evolve. How do we know that something's possible until we get an inkling of maybe someone's done something similar? You know, and it's a great example. We watched, um, you know, we watched someone like Ned Brockman run across the country and all of a sudden everyone's out on these big crazy runs now you know, because it's possible. Someone showed it's possible. There's always got to be, you know, there'll always be innovators or leaders or pioneers who go and do it first. And I hope that in, in some areas I can be that in my own life. I know my parents were, you know, I was two parents with a young boy with CF. But I believe that when we hear story and we're inspired by story, it levels us up. And, you know, conversation is really powerful and important. And I want to provide that for people. And I'm, I'm grateful that with podcasts, we can do that for free. There's no barrier to learning anymore. You don't have to go to, to university to get an education in business if you can't afford it or you don't have that opportunity. You can sit and listen to a podcast like The Mentor, you know, or you can sit and listen to someone like Will Ahmed on my podcast and learn from a, a person like that. It's an incredible privilege. But do you think therefore your mission now, at least now, or at least since the beginning of COVID, which is you know, only three years ago, do you think your mission is for you to learn or for you to provide a platform for others to learn or for you to provide a platform for others to listen to whilst Bradley learns? A little bit of all. I think we're always developing and I know how much I've evolved as a man I speak about the podcast in the sense that it's made a real man out of me. 
because, you know, it's, it's really encouraged empathy. It's shown me another side to life that I never experienced. You know, I used to, I used to think, Mark, now how can someone get addicted to drugs? That's like preposterous to me. And then you sit down with someone on the podcast who talks about, you know, the violence that they grew up in or the kind of environment in which they were surrounded by in their early years. And I think, man, escaping. yeah, you've lived so different to me. I can understand why there's some hardship and there's a hole in your heart that you're trying to fill. Whilst that's never the right answer, I can understand why you've led down that path because I've made mistakes in my life too. And so it's made an empathetic man out of me, but it's also, also shown me that and ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And I believe we're just all ordinary people at the core. The difference between the people who have extraordinary success is they believe they can and they do something about it. And I think that's always the message of the podcast is that just like my guests today, just like you, just like I, you know, if you're listening and you want to change your life, you can. I often think one of the reasons I've done lots of things in my life is because I try to keep myself busy to distract me from things that bother me. Um, and but I've just been lucky in doing those things. I've been successful at it. Not everything, by the way. Some of the things I wasn't success, successful at. But a lot of the times I'm, I decide to take things on, or perhaps sometimes too much, is can be a bit of a distraction about things that a, a distraction from things that are that I prefer not to think about or not to do. And then I look at you, and given that you're you've been born with and lived with an affliction, which you'll continue to live with, which is fine. You're doing a good job at it. But you seem to have a lot of people around you, even on your left arm, people around you that are very inspirational. Look at the list of some of the people who've been on your podcast are inspirational people, people of high achievers, big achievers. Do you ever think to yourself, am I doing this because I'm just trying to distract myself from the thing that really bothers me? It's an interesting question, Mark. I don't think I've ever done anything to distract myself. I'm, I'm pretty aware. I'd say I'm, I'm very self-aware and I, I find I can't move forward and feel free until I face a challenge. I'm one of those people who can't distract myself. You know, I'm, I'm always thinking, I'm always ticking inside, no matter how busy my life is or how manic it is. You know, the biggest problems are the ones within me, always. And I mean that from a just a self-aware point. But I'll say that I think a lot of, you know, there's a, another tattoo. We talk about tattoos on my right wrist and it's it's something I wrote on a, a bit of a lastoplast the morning of my first mar my first charity marathon for CF. And it says, for all you've done, today I'll make you proud. And it's got my dad, my mum and my sister's name. And, you know, if it as was- As a dedication. As a dedication. And if I was to have this tattoo today, I'd have my partner's Soph's name at the top of it as well. But I truly believe, Mark, that I was given- an incredible gift in people who believed in me. And every single day I think about how I'm going to make them proud, how I'm going to make myself proud, how I'm going to prove, not just for other people who are watching on, you know, the many families who I've been able to connect with who have little ones with CF, many people with CF who are around my age or maybe older who are still facing challenges. You know, I look at my life as an opportunity to do some good, you know, as an opportunity, if, if at anything, to do some good for myself. You know, I, I want to be a, a father in a couple of years. You know, I want to have a family of my own. I want my kids to look up to me, you know, and and think, you know, dad's my Hercules. Dad's my role model. He's the person that I want to be like. And so every day for me is an opportunity to prove to myself that I'm, I'm making the best of the incredible gift that I've been given. So a sense of gratitude. An incredible sense of gratitude. I count my blessings every day. I remember training for my first marathon. I'd just come out of hospital. And I had really rough time with some bleeding lungs over the course of a week. And, you know, I was out on this run a couple of weeks later and I was most definitely not a long distance runner, Mark. I've, you know, I spoke about being a, a track champ as a young kid, 100 and 200 meters. You know, 400 meters was an endurance race for me. I enjoy the short stuff. I remember being on my first ever 20K run. I'd lost about eight kilos at this point. You know, for the first time in a while, I don't have them today, but I had a set of abs. I felt tanned. I felt energetic. My lungs felt open and full. And I remember running through a little trail near the beach at home. And I felt tired in my legs at 12Ks, but I was out to run 20. And I remember thinking, 
I need to think about how blessed I am to be out here. You know, some people call it gratitude. I call it counting my blessings. And as I was running through this trail, I, I likely look like a crazy man. But I remember like just yelling out, you know, blessed to be out here running because there's days where I couldn't. Blessed to be healthy because there's people with CF who aren't. You know, blessed to have people that love me and support me. Blessed that I have cystic fibrosis. And I was just like, I'm fucking blessed. Like I'm blessed that I can do this in spite of everything I've faced. So every day I count my blessings, how lucky I am to be the man that I am with the people around me doing what I'm doing. How lucky I am to have a chance at that. You know, some people don't. And, and, and I don't know if I should ask this question, but, but I mean, um, what, what, what's the prognosis for you going forward? I mean, is it, is it a, if you continue to stay healthy and you're, you've got a partner, I don't know if you're married or whatever, but you want to have a kid and you want to have a family at least, is the prognosis uh, f fulfilling? Is it going to be good for you? I mean, or is there something you have to be worried about? So for people with cystic fibrosis, the life expectancy right now in Australia is around 41. Now, things have really improved the last year or two, Mark. So, you know, in 2022, um, I had the privilege of going and meeting um, the Prime Minister at the time to discuss what was an impending um, PBS um, like a, a drug that was going to be life changing. Funds for the funds. Yeah, yeah something so to be on the on the list. So we we're going to have something brought to the list that we'd campaign for for a long, long time. Now, granted, it wasn't the the prime minister's choice to do that. It comes from the PBAC board, um, but a drug called Trikafta was coming into our lives, and we'd seen the incredible work that it had done overseas in in the UK and the US, where people were raving about the benefits of, you know, if they were able to take it, because there's some people with CF who have a different genetic mutation who can't take Trikafta just yet. We, we need more testing and trials and we need some, you know, innovations on that drug, I guess you'd say, some modifications. But this drug essentially is what they call a, a modulator drug. So it somewhat helps the defective gene do its job a little better. And so it's not a cure, um, but it's the closest thing we have. And this drug was, was, you know, having benefits of an increase in 10 to 40% lung function for people. Now, as someone who's operated with less than um, normal lung function for his whole life and capacity, the idea of getting a little bit more is like outstanding. It's almost like someone's giving you a performance enhancer. You know, we were hearing stories that people who were coughing up green sticky mucus like I was every day had no mucus anymore. And so there were all these raving benefits in people like dropping and reducing tablets, putting on weight, you know, feeling and looking healthy for the first time in their sea of lives. And in May 2022, I got to take that drug for the first time. It had just become available on the PBS. Before that, it was like $120,000 a year. So families who were desperate were mortgaging their homes. Totally you know, privileged. Trying to get on compassionate access for it. And so I was given this drug. And I remember looking at it in the morning. Oh, it's two orange tablets in the morning, one blue, one at night. You take it with a little bit of fat. And I remember thinking, this could change my life but I don't expect it to because that's dangerous. That's complacency again. But, you know, maybe just maybe if I do things right, this will change my life. Within the space of three days, all the mucus in my lungs had gone. Wow. I haven't coughed up green sticky mucus since. It's been oh, about wow. a year and a half that's now. Unreal. Um, put on about five kilos of muscle, which is great. And I got an extra kick. You know, the thing that was really important for me, Mark, is whilst this will like add, you know, a good 10 years of life expectancy for people with CF, you know, I never believed that those things were going to define me anyways. You know, so if someone come to me tomorrow and said, unfortunately, mate, we've got to take Trikafta from you. Yes, it'd be hard. Yes, it'd be challenging. Yes, it would feel unfair. But sometimes life is. Now, I don't believe it's going to be taken away from us. And I believe there'll be many exciting innovations. But I love that at that point in time, I'd prove to myself, well, I'd run two marathons with bleeding lungs before this drug was, was in my hands. You know, I've survived 26 years and I've found a way not just to survive, but thrive. And so, you know, people talk about life expectancy, but when they said that the average life expectancy for, you know, someone like yourself, Mark, who, you know, I don't know your health background, but maybe you don't have any comorbidities or any issues with your health. They say, you know, Mark, you should get a good 81 years here in Australia. And 4, no one's giving, weeks. Well, no one's giving you that guarantee though, are they? No. They're not saying, hey mate, here's your ticket. And I'll tell you what, on your 81st birthday, I'm sorry, but it runs out. We're all just operating in a world in which the unknown is something we all have to face. So I don't believe in life expectancy because no one can promise me anything. But I know that every day what I can do is get up and do my absolute best to make sure that I maximize that opportunity. And so, you know, I've made my partner so for promise that I'm going to give it everything I've got to get to 100. You know, I want to make sure that my kids are thinking, God, when this, when's this guy kicking the bucket so we can get that podcast inheritance? 
you know, I want to be here for a long time, Mark. I love life. You know, I wake up every day and I'm excited for the day ahead. I bounce out of bed at quarter to five in the morning because I'm ready to go. And so I'll never take it for granted, but I'll never believe any prognosis because I've proven them all wrong. If that, I mean, that's an unbelievably good answer. Uh, it's not what I expected either, to be frank with you. And in terms of the, the podcasts are hard to commercialize. You know, very challenging. Very hard, um, particularly, particularly these days because there's lots of them. But so what do you do to supplement your income? What are you doing now, like daytime-wise? Or whenever it is you got spare time. You know, you know, it's funny, Mark, that this is a lesson I've learned the hard way. So in early 2021, I was so broke I had to sell that property that I'd purchased in 2020. And, you know, I sold that property and thankfully at the time the market was great. It was you know, unreal. My mum, who at the time was a great car salesperson, had uh, doubled as a real estate agent at that time because I was out of the business. She spent a bit of time working in the industry and sold it for a great price for me. And I made a good profit. It was crazy. To be honest, it was like crazy. I'd made 30% profit in a year. And as a young man, I was like, oh, this is my ticket to chase my dream for the next while. And, you know, I got to a point, Mark, where the dream hadn't exactly come to fruition yet. I was, I was doing what I needed to do every day. Maybe I'd been a little bit complacent because I've been given a ticket to chase it with that profit. I've been trying to make it happen. I'd been hustling. I'd been looking for opportunities. Hadn't come to fruition. I got to a point where I was at rock bottom again. And so it's been a challenging 12 months, Mark, like trying to figure out, you know, when you're in this business, you realize that, you know, opportunities come. And as someone who, you know, I don't, I don't have the profile or the past experience to, to expect these guests to just walk into my studio. I'll have to hustle to get these guests. You know, I'm often working for months at a time, pitching to, to their managers, pitching to their teams, trying to get those opportunities. So you've got to be available. And so, you know, I tried my hand at doing a bit of real estate part-time. It didn't work. I had, you know, at the time I created my charity marathon event and that was getting me some publicity and media as a byproduct of that. And we'd raised some great money. And it was interesting that I was getting all these opportunities to go and to go and speak and share my story, whether it was on, you know, with Sam Mac on Sunrise, it's how Sam and I met. Uh, you know, it was, you know, these different events and conferences where I was there to just try and raise money for the cause. And people kept saying to me, mate, you do a great job of telling your story. You know, you have no problem speaking in front of a crowd. You should do this for a living. And I was like, can you do that? Is that a thing? And they're like, yeah, it's called keynote speaking. You know, you should get into that business. And so I started to then go, okay, well, maybe that's a really great way to fulfill what feels very meaningful and purpose-driven for me in sharing my story. But it's a little bit easier to commercialize than podcasts are. So I look for opportunities. I pitch myself to agencies. I had no filmed experience, but I'd been given a few opportunities where I went and got them filmed. I got signed by some keynote speaking agencies, but I maybe got a little bit complacent again and thought that it would just happen for me. And I think that what I've learned, Mark, the lesson over the last couple of years is that, you know, whilst you can work really hard, you don't ever really deserve anything. You always have to earn it. You have to continually earn it every day. Every day. And it's been challenging that I haven't figured out the balance yet. But I'm actually now working as a casual laborer a couple of days a week. It's a job that I really enjoy the lads that I work with. They're all great lads. And, you know, I go and build wedding marquees and and bust a sweat for eight, 10 hours a day, a couple of days a week and, you know, get paid to to go and do that and have a good time just, you know, laughing on site and burning some calories and moving some timber. And then I come home and I, I focus all my energy in those days that I'm not working on building this thing and looking for those opportunities. The keynote stuff is slowly but surely happening and you know i got to speak at humankind where we met this year you know that was an incredible response and i got invited back for a second day and so i've been given some great opportunities but as you know it takes time in that space which agency are you with so i'm with saxton i'm with icmi celebrity speakers platinum speakers and um inspire i believe some of the few agencies but my predominant contracts saxton's are the biggest yeah I've, i've got some great contacts at saxton and you know i do you know, I love what I do when I get on stage individually. I've also got a, a great mate of mine, Brett Kennellan, where we do a joint keynote presentation. We're actually off to Newcastle to do that this week. And so I've got some opportunities there, Mark, where I really want to connect with audiences and, and share what I believe to be the lessons, the valuable lessons that I've learned through some of my hardship. And I think that that's essentially what I'm trying to get at. The talk's called Blessed with Bleeding Lungs. And it's all about empowering people with the fact that your life is going to be very challenging and very hard. Like that's something I can guarantee you. However, through that hardship, there are these lessons that can be learned that will then allow you to face the next lot of challenges. And that's resilience. 
It's purpose. It's perspective. It's understanding that, you know, every day, if you empower yourself with these things, and often, you know, don't look too far outside of yourself. You know, you're a living, breathing example of being able to face adversity and get up again the next day. I'm like, that's an incredible thing. We all have our challenges. You know, someone can look to me and say, mate, CF would be hard. Yeah, it is. But I'm sure that there's stuff in their life that's challenging too that I wouldn't want to face. You know, I've, there's, a, there's a great quote, I think I've heard Kamara Usman say it, that, you know, his grandmother used to say, if we all threw our problems in a pile, you'd pick yours up and run home quickly. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I've got my challenges. I'm happy to face them. Everyone does. But through the way that we challenge them and, and face them, we learn lessons. You know, I just hope that I can teach those lessons to people and, and share them. I have to be honest with you, like, uh, I've, got, I've got a really big week this week, okay? Um, I'll tell you straight up. And, and, and I, tomorrow I've got a really big day in my non-podcast uh, world. A really big day, a really important day for me. And, uh, and uh, Sunday night, last night when I went to bed, I wasn't looking forward to waking up this morning and because I knew what I had to, what I had to do this week, not, not so much the podcast, but what, what's ahead of me for the rest of the day and tomorrow. And um, um, I think that uh, you must have been sent to me on purpose just to give me a little bit of a, an uppercut and to say, um, uh, stop feeling sorry for yourself or stop thinking like that and just get on with your fucking your day because, Mark, you know, like you, um, I've been blessed, you know, six to eight years and I'm fucking – pretty healthy you know i'm pretty good you're a sharp looking cat for 68 thanks, let me tell you thanks mate but uh but like you like you said like uh everybody's got shit that they think they're dealing with until they see someone else's shit mm. or in your case the example you just gave the pile <laughs> and uh and uh my shit's nothing compared to a lot of other people's and uh and i'm lucky enough to to be frank with you have an opportunity to talk to you today which has actually set me up for the rest of the week and probably tomorrow's thing that I've got to do is one of the – it's not the, the biggest deal I've ever done in my life, but it's one of the most um, confronting things I have to do. It's a business thing. Mm. I don't mean in a bad way, but it's, a, it's intellectually difficult. And, uh, and now I feel empowered. I'm glad to hear that. So Likewise. You just, so you just inspired me. You motivated me. Um, you gave me a leveler. And what you made me do, because I think this is what everyone's got to do. Every now and then you've got to give yourself an uppercut and, uh, you know, shut the fuck up and get on with it. Thanks very much, Brad. Mate, my absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me.